friends! Welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. Look at all these drops. Welcome, everyone. Um, in this episode, we are going to implement the SQL database that we designed last time, but we're going to use ConnectJS to implement it. Um, welcome to the show. <laughs> and if you didn't tune in last time, uh, we created this diagram. If you look in the description of the video, there is a link to Lucidchart, and you can see this diagram um, in real time as I work on it. Um, I'll go, I'll say hello to everyone before we, we, before we get too deep into it, but I'll also review the diagram that we created, um, and feel free to ask any questions you may have about this diagram. And there are also a few things that we'll need to fix on it, but we'll get to that. Um, let's say hello to everyone. Hello, Wheels Gaming. Welcome. Hello, Justin. Hello, Rich. Hello, May. Hello, Scrimpy. Um, good morning, Justin. I'm glad you made it. <laughs> hello, Kamal. Hello, Pocho. Hello, Lizard Keeper. Hello, Himanshu. Hello, Domenico. Hello, Ayub. Hello, Ayush. Hello, Fetty. <laughs> uh, nice. Got, uh, people got the notification. Yeah, so I have a mobile app that's in alpha testing right now that'll send a push notification when I go live. So, hello, Greasy Root. Hello, Andrew. Infi, are you sure about that? Because I'm pretty sure I fixed the typo. <laughs> hello, Sim John. Welcome. Um, nice. Refactor got the iOS notification. That's good. Hello, Flu. <laughs> Hello, Satyam. Uh, if you do exclamation mark project, you'll see what we're going to do. But basically, we're going to take this diagram and implement it. Um, typically, you could implement this directly with SQL code for creating all the tables and, and creating the relationships. Uh, but we're going to use a library called ConnectJS, uh, which is my preferred library for working with SQL databases uh, in JavaScript and Node.js. Um, gone? Was it? <laughs> I think the typo was gone. <laughs> yeah, welcome, Morpheus. Hopefully, hopefully I can take your mind off things for, for an hour or two. Um, oh, yeah, and I'm, <laughs> I, I'm preempting. How, 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 who wants to take bets on how many people are going to ask what theme I'm using? Um, but if you do exclamation mark theme, you can get a link to the theme that I'm using. I'm trying a new one out, and it's pretty cool. I like the color scheme. Um, it's called Just Black. Um, you'll get a better idea of what it looks like when we start writing some code. But yeah, who wants to take bets? How many people are going to ask about my theme? Um, <laughs> Ilana got way too many notifications. Well, that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> and hello, Sirdar. Welcome. Hello, Scott. Yeah, it'll be totally from scratch. So uh, of course, uh, feel free to ask any questions you have about Connects, but I'm going to try to explain it from the ground up. Um, and... Yeah, that's the plan. So yeah, feel free to ask anything. Uh, ConnectJS, well, I'll talk about it in a second, but ConnectJS is a query builder. So um, there are things called ORMs, which are object relational mappers. And then there's something like Connects, which is simply just a query builder. Uh, and it's also a, um, a tool for creating your schemas, for doing the data definition language part of SQL. Um, but something like SQLize it can be done like model first, well, we'll talk about it, and we'll talk about the differences. <laughs> um, yeah, and hello, uh, Gurglin. Let's see if I can get uh, all the hellos in. Hello, I, Ali, and all the other isolated developers. Hello, uh, Pinterader. <laughs> hello, Jayub. Hello, Yash. I'm doing pretty good. I got plenty of sleep. I'm feeling good, ready to write some code. Hello, Kamal. Hello, Free Debugs. It's been a while. Welcome. Hopefully, you're doing okay. <laughs> hello, Kunal. Hello, Altug. Uh, hello, Win3200 Day. Hello, the ox. Hello, Sebastian. Hello, pumpkin freak. Pumping freak? <laughs> Hello, Elkatron. Hello, Vimy. Good morning, Wasif. Good morning, Eternal Dev Coder. Hello, Phantom. Hello, Lewis. Hello, Marishi. <laughs> uh, Diego says, I didn't see the first stream, but what's the purpose of the database? Uh, just food inventory or everything in your house? Yeah, the plan is to do everything in my house. Um, Typically, like food inventory works really well uh, because if you have a, like a large stock of food and you want to keep track of when there are things going to expire or how much do you have, um, we'll use it for that. But I also have a lot of other random things like electronics components and laptops and devices. Um, and so really the way we designed this was to be very generic and just talk about things as a product. Uh, and it's almost like we're designing an inventory system for a store. It can really hold any types of inventory. Um, but yeah, so that's the plan. And hello, Ayush. <laughs> Good morning, El. Hello, Eternal Dev Coder. Again. <laughs> hello, Linus. It's been a while. Welcome. Hello, Ali. Hello, Coding Pasta. It's also been a while. Welcome back. Hello, Rodan. Good morning, Agent Key. <laughs> Spread the love. Nice. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Satyam, your first stream. Hello, Sean. Hello, Ed Destius. <laughs> hello, Asya. Hello, Manap. 
Hello, Schlauch. <laughs> Was that a bad word? I don't know. Uh, one line of me. Hello, GameStep. Hello, George. Hello, Sujan. Um, hey, 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 hey. Welcome, everyone. Hey, Joe Mama. What's up? Um, okay, so that's about all the hellos that I'm going to do. Um, I, I got a few more. Hello, uh, Dezaka. Hello, Marcos. Hello, Vince. Um, if you have, like I mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Um, we'll try to get to all of that. But before, before we get too deep into it, I am going to review the database that we designed. Uh, and actually, while I'm reviewing it, we're going to do a poll. Um, so we're going to implement this. And uh, we can use pretty much any SQL database. So one of the cool things about ConnectJS is it has adapters for all of the popular SQL databases. Uh, My MySQL or MariaDB, Postgres, SQLite. Oracle, Microsoft SQL. So you can use the same library to talk to any of those databases. Um, and so I'm giving, I'm, I'm putting it in the hands of the viewers. What are we going to use? Um, and you have two options, uh, MySQL or Postgres. <laughs> uh, because when we set this up, we're probably going to do a Docker container to spin up that database. Um, I mean, technically, we could do SQLite. And it would actually make it a lot easier, because that SQLite is just a flat file database. Um, but two options, MySQL or Postgres. <laughs> um, so go here to vote and whatever has the most votes, that's what we're going to try to use. And we will attempt to, uh, set up, um, that particular database with a Docker container. So that'll be fun to do as well. Um, and thanks for the follow for BCO. Welcome. Ooh, Microsoft SQL. <laughs> I don't, I've, uh, so I, I worked with Microsoft SQL a long time ago. I don't know if you could put that in a Docker container. Doesn't it have like licenses and stuff like that? But yeah. Uh, will I do a live stream where I build a front end that displays information about the coronavirus? Uh, I didn't plan on it. Um, I'm doing some stuff with, uh, APIs that I may talk about or stream. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Select Microsoft SQL so I can't use it. <laughs> And hello, everyone from India. Yeah, Pranjal is saying India is locked down for 21 uh, days. So uh, I live in Denver, Colorado, and they just issued a um, like a shelter in place, stay at home protocol. Um, so we are not allowed to leave the house unless for um, a good reason. Like you can go grocery shopping, you can go for a run or a walk. But for the most part, you have to stay home. And there's like a thousand dollar fine if you don't do that. Um so people are, or governments are starting to take it very seriously. And oh, oh, well, we'll see you later, Andrew. Hope you enjoy the class. <laughs> I guess it's an online class, right? And hello, everyone. Um, you can run Microsoft SQL and Docker? Okay, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> Only because it's been like years since I've used it. And hello, Tats. Oh, it basically means uh, chives. Schnittlauch. Schnittlauch? It sounds like a curse word in English. <laughs> Uh, I've used Redis and I've looked into Memcache. Yeah. I vote Oracle. Cool. And the notification came through, but it says null. What's up with that? Oh, system UI. What? <laughs> um, Twitch says you can chat in 11 hours. Oh, um, it may, I, I don't know. I don't know. There are too many things on the screen. We're going to disable the drop game once we start talking about all this stuff. Uh, could I explain multiplicity in UML? Um, no, because I've never heard of it. We can look it up, though. <laughs> uh, this is technically an entity relationship diagram. It's not a UML, um, but it's somewhat similar to a UML, I think. Yeah, New Zealand is locked down for four weeks. No fast food shops open at all. Wow. Yeah, so in Denver, restaurants can't have people sit down to eat, but they can do takeout and delivery. But yeah. Yeah, Nepal, South Africa. Honestly, the United States could could issue a lot more restrictions. They're not, and they probably should. And it's only going to get worse if they don't. Yeah, Linus says, in Switzerland, all stores are closed, and you also have to have a good reason to leave your house. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, nice. Uh, that's it's good to hear, Majestic Guy. And hello, uh, R from Pakistan. Uh, what about Mongo? So, I mean, technically, you could implement this model in Mongo, but Mongo, and we didn't really talk about this last time, but Mongo is a NoSQL database. Um, and we have created a SQL design. Um, and the, the thing about SQL databases is that built into the database is a way of creating relationships between tables and enforcing those relationships. So when I talk about the database model in a second, when I talk about these tables being related, 
a database management system like MySQL or Postgres is going to enforce those relationships. If you use something like Mongo, technically, you could manually create relationships between document stores, but MongoDB doesn't care. Um, it's not enforced at the database level. And thanks for the follow, Lili. <laughs> Good to see you uh, as well. Kiss my pixels. Yeah, I like Postgres a lot. Oh, you're welcome. Greetings from Poland. Very cool. Uh, do I have a good resource for database design? Um, check out my last video, honestly. Um, it's not like it's not a very structured lesson. We kind of just talk about what do we want, and then I show you how I would model that. Um, definitely check out uh, SQL Zoo. It's like a free website to learn SQL. They have a bunch of exercises. Uh, uh, SQL basics, I believe. Yeah, so you can, they have like a sample database that you can query against and you can learn all the basic uh, syntax for querying. It's not about modeling. Yeah. In Australia, we are free. <laughs> oh, nice. That's good to hear. And thanks for the follow, Hackron. I vote Rolodex cards. We can't trust computers during these trouble times. You're so right, John Sugar. We should just do it by hand. <laughs> Okay, Netherlands has a similar soft lockdown. The thing is, it's only a matter of time before they do a full lockdown. They should just go ahead and implement it, honestly. I don't know. And thanks for the follow, DMNZTV. It's uh, more of a curfew. Okay. Thanks for the follow, the PW. Um, did Men what did Menop say? Uh, send your message again, Menop. I don't think I... Uh, it might have been too long ago. And I, that's probably not how you pronounce your name. I don't know how to uh, pronounce, uh, is it uh, Cyrillic, Cyrillic? Yeah. And hello, Kevin. Hello, honey. Um, yeah, it's a little bit off topic for today. Have I messed with Neo4j? I have. <laughs> I haven't done anything big or official with it yet. And yes, I am working from home. Uh, Topher says, I've used MySQL, uh, Microsoft SQL for so long that the last time I tried to use MySQL, it was very difficult. Yeah. Hello, Topher. Welcome. Uh, same thing, Majestic Eye. <laughs> like, I stay home most of the time anyway, so this is no big change for me. And hello, Splart. Um, <laughs> yeah, that more than two people can... Yeah, and so there, there's similar restrictions in place um, where you have to be at least six feet away from other people, no, gathering, no gatherings at all. Yeah. Okay. Let's do this. We're going to disable the drop game. Great drops, everyone. Good work. <laughs> uh, eventually, we'll build a front end for this app, but we got to do it one step at a time. We designed the database. Today, we're going to implement it. Eventually, we'll create an API on top of the database, and then eventually, we'll build a front end or a mobile app to talk to this app. Okay, but let's talk about what we built here. So uh, we designed a, um, a system to store inventory. And I'm calling it a home inventory system because I'm most likely just going to use it to keep track of all the things in my house. Uh, last time we showed baked beans um, and um, talked about the idea of having multiple quantities of something. And there's different aspects like the size of this thing and the manufacturer and the expiration date and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I'm going to keep track of all the food in my pantry as well as other things. So um, one thing to note about this database model is every single record will have a created at time and an updated at time. And for this database model, we're doing what's known as soft deletes. So we will never, ever actually remove anything from the database. If we need to update any or like remove it, we just set the deleted at time um, as like a, a, a date time, a timestamp. And um, our system, like the front end, if we eventually build one, won't show anything that has a deleted at date. Um, but that gives us the potential to restore things that were deleted. Um, and also, because we're dealing with a lot of relationships here, if you were to delete one thing, if it has certain dependencies, you would need to delete those other things as well. That's known as a cascading delete. Um, but it could result in a lot of things being deleted. So we're doing soft deletes. And ultimately, it's a home inventory system. So we have users. Multiple users can live in a household and manage the system. Um, we have items. Item is like a product. It is a very general thing that describes any item in our system. Um, we'll have an item type, things like canned goods, um, electronics, uh, dry goods, all sorts of item types. Um, we haven't added the comment table yet, but eventually we'll add that so users will be able to comment on the items in our inventory. Uh, we have a manufacturer entity, so every item in our system has a manufacturer. 
Um, we have an item location. So that's a location in my house, whether it's the pantry upstairs or my living room or the pantry in my basement, every item will uh, get a location. Um, and I don't believe we added the purchase location yet, but I think we're going to implement what we have and we can always add new tables later. So let's look at this database model. Um, first up, you have the user entity and um, this has an email, a name and a password. And last time we added this uh, last login field here. And I'm thinking um, we could potentially have a separate table that stores the date time of every successful login instead of just the last login. That could complicate things, we'll leave it there. <laughs> um, and then any user can create an item. So an item is the general description of an item. So this here is a can of Bush's baked beans and this would have one entry in the item table. And the item table has all of the information that's uh, general to every single can of, big, uh, of Bush's baked beans. So it has the name, it has the description, um, it has the weight, the skew, which is like the barcode on the back. Um, and so we have that table and there's only gonna be one entry for Bush's baked beans. But as you can see, I have two, uh, two cans of Bush's baked beans. Um, and so to keep track of that, we have a separate table called uh, item info. And so for every instance of this particular uh, brand and flavor of Bush's baked beans, we're gonna have a row in the item info, info table. And the item info table is information that's explicit about uh, each individual can of beans. So each can of beans will potentially have a unique purchase date, a, a unique expiration date, um, a unique last used date, uh, a, a unique price. And so for every unique can of Bush's baked beans, we're gonna have a row in this item info, info table. And we can see that it relates back to the item table. So it has a foreign key reference to the item table. So any entry in here, we can relate back and see what is the general information about that item, like its description and different things like that. Um, we can see that an item also has an item type. And the item type, like I mentioned, are things like canned goods, electronics, other things like that. And so um, one item can have one item type, and that's a foreign key relationship to the item type table. Um, one item can potentially have multiple images attached to it. So uh, we can see that the item images, which someone commented, I forget who it was, but um, one thing we were doing is all of our entities, we're naming them uh, in singular instead of plural because an entity describes one instance of a thing, uh, whereas multiple records or multiple rows in the table would be plural. So this should be singular. We're going to call that item image. But for every image we have for this, I could take one picture of the front, one picture of the back, etc. Each one will be inserted into this table and it has a foreign key reference back to the item table. So every image is tied to a specific item. Um, and then we also allow to add related items. So you might say that uh, Bush's Baked Beans original is related to Bush's Baked Beans bacon flavor <laughs> because they're very similar. Um, so we can link those. Uh, and then every item also has one manufacturer. Um, and a manufacturer has a name, a logo, a description, a type, a website. And the manufacturer can be something like uh, Bush Brothers and Company, P.O. Box 52330, Department C. Um, and so we'll have an uh, entry in the manufacturer table and that relates uh, or has one address. Um, and so there was a comment on the last video that mentioned, shouldn't this address to manufacturer be a one-to-one -one relationship instead of a one-to-many relationship? Um, and that's probably true, but one thing that could happen is you could potentially have two different manufacturers that have the same address. I don't know exactly why that would happen, but it might actually happen. So this could be a one-to-many, but otherwise it's probably a one-to-one -one because one address relates to one manufacturer and you don't really repeat an address, potentially. Um, but we're storing the address separately and it has all the info. And then we're also storing the states and the countries in separate tables. Um, and so the state is gonna be a lookup on the state table or the state ID, and the country is gonna be, a, uh, the country ID will be a lookup on the country table. Um, and so, this is, this is a lot of tables and there's a lot of relationships here, um, but eventually, as, as we get further and further uh, into this, you'll see why we have these separate tables. Like if you ever go to a website and it has you enter your, in your address, um, but a manufacturer can have more than one address? I guess that's true. I'm going by, this one has one, man, one address on the back. If it had multiple addresses, we would need a join table um, instead of just 
uh, a foreign foreign key. I'm going to go with the idea that um, items can only have one manufacturer. <laughs> um, but think about this. You're on a website, and you're entering your, your address. If you live in the United States, there's a state drop-down that lists all possible states. Um, and it's good to have that because you want to do some validation, right? You wouldn't want every user to be able to enter in their own state. Um, and um, because you could result in different capitalizations, some people not abbreviating it correctly. So if you have a source of truth, which is like a list of all possible states, you can then show that in the dropdown and then uh, just store the state ID. Uh, and uh, IC Killer just, just asked the question, shouldn't the state be related to the country? Uh, probably. And we could technically add a foreign key reference on the state table that says country ID. I don't know if we're going to do that. Um, we could. And in that case, I might even put it into a single table, like country state. I don't know. We're going to leave it. <laughs> um, and um, there, we, we talked about it before. You potentially could have had a separate table with a list of all possible cities. At some point, you have to decide whether or not you want to get that intense with your database model. And I've decided that we're not going to. So um, that's most of the model. Let's see. Uh, item, a specific item also has a location. This is the location in my house. That's why each instance can have its own location. Like this one could be in my pantry upstairs and this one could be in my pantry downstairs. Um, and then we also have shape information. Uh, one thing was on the item table, we actually have this weight column, but there is a size table that has a uh, volume, which I think can account for weight. So I'm actually going to remove weight from the item table because it already exists technically on the size table. It's a lot of tables. <laughs> and so what we're going to do next is we're actually going to write code that uh, implements these tables in a SQL database and adds all of their relationships. Um, now, there's a lot of chats that happened. I'm probably not going to be able to get to all of them. I'm just going to do a little bit of a scroll. And I will acknowledge all the follows that happen. Uh, thanks for the follow, Classic Uncle. Thanks for the follow, Fabricio. Thanks for the follow, Lili. Thanks for the follow, Hackron. Uh, thanks for the follow, uh, the PW. Uh, thanks for the follow, Dragon Dust. Thanks for the follow, Rockman. Thanks for the follow, Heavy Metal. And thanks for the follow, Dysfunction. Uh, Dysumphanok? <laughs> Looks like Dysfunction. <laughs> um, cool. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Can you give us some insight? Are we going to use Docker or Kubernetes? No. So uh, Kubernetes is typically used for uh, production systems that scale, where you want to have uh, multiple instances of Docker containers that are communicating with each other or that are load balanced. Uh, we're just going to use Docker so that we don't have to install Connects or Postgres directly on my machine. So that's what we'll use it for. <laughs> yeah, so uh, setting up Docker is going to be part of this stream, so you, you will see it. And hello, Imran. Uh, what do I want to use for entity mapping? Uh, I mean, we're using this tool to design it, and then depending on uh, what... Uh, so this this tool is called Lucid Chart, and there is a link in the description if you want to see this particular chart. Um, but depending on which database we choose, we'll use that to actually implement the relationships. Um, let's see how the results are doing. Um, it's very, very close. So um, go here and vote now. <laughs> And yeah, so um, I will allow that message to happen. <laughs> but um, my overlay here does some sanitizing, so that wouldn't actually work. Um, you can put your batteries. Yeah, so absolutely. So uh, think about it. Like if you're if you're preparing for an apocalypse and you have an inventory and you want to keep track of all your things, um, you could store what batteries do you have. You could store how many flashlights do you have. Um, you could know when you need to buy new batteries, different things like that. Yeah. Uh, SQL takes serious amounts of time to master, which a lot of front-end devs struggle with. Don't read my name. I'm too lazy to change it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, like, this is serious. So somebody commented on the last video as well that some people literally have entire careers where they do nothing but model and implement SQL databases. Um, but in the 
fairly recent trend, I don't know, the past three, four years, this idea of a full stack developer is someone that can do it all. Uh, and I'm someone like that. And um, I learned about SQL databases. I learned how to implement them. I can build APIs to talk to those SQL databases. I am by no means a SQL database expert. I am a programmer centric SQL database person um, in that you can get really intense with SQL. You can create highly optimized queries um, and do highly optimized joins and things like that. Whereas when I'm implementing things, a lot of times I'll actually reach for application logic that would potentially do multiple queries versus just one query. There's a lot of pros and cons to that, but you're absolutely right. Like SQL is hard and it takes a long time to master. Um, yeah, we're going to use uh, connects for sure. And what type of cases would you choose soft delete instead of an actual drop? Really any system where you want to have a history of what has happened. Um, and so if we ever delete an item from the system, that's potentially because I don't have it in my pantry anymore. But let's say down the road, I buy that item again and I want it to show back up. I can essentially undelete it. So there'd be like an unarchive or an archive feature. And that's really what we're doing here. We're not deleting, we're archiving. So that in the future we can unarchive. Um, and it's, uh, there might be some, ap some applications where you definitely want that, but it's really up to the implementer and, and the person that wants this application. Like, how do you want it to behave? Um, I would say most of the apps that I have in production actually do soft delete. So we only allow the users to archive. Um, and that's really because SQL databases are meant for a lot of data. And so you don't really have to worry about removing rows unless you're dealing with massive, massive data. And that's a whole nother problem, but yeah. Are you able to build in auditing to your databases? I don't know what you mean by that. <laughs> um, I'm using a piece of software called OBS. I also have a, um, a video capture card. Um, if you look at coding.garden slash gear, not that, um, you can get a list of all the things that I use to stream and record my screen. So you can check that out. And it's tied right now between MySQL and Postgres. So keep voting. voting. <laughs> Here, I'll share the poll again. Um, okay, let's keep talking. <laughs> Yeah, I'm using OBS. Uh, Tover says, I heard that Bush Baked Beans dog passed away. I think that happened, yeah. Oh, nice. Trey's working with SQL databases today. Uh, Honey says, I've seen people using MongoDB as a relational database management system, like modeling relations. I think this is not, this is not Mon what Mongo was made for. Is it a good way to use Mongo? Why should you not use their RDMS? Yeah, a, a reason a lot of people choose Mongo to begin with is that it's very flexible in that you don't have to have these rigid relationships in your document stores like you do with SQL. However, that's how a lot of people end up using Mongo anyway. So they would use a library, if, especially in JavaScript, you use this library called uh, mongoose.js, which can actually implement schema validation and foreign key relationships. But this is implemented at the application level. This is implemented with JavaScript code. The actual Mongo database doesn't care how you insert or relate things, but this library allows you to do that. Um, and potentially people like to do that because what I'm about to do, which is implement the SQL database, it takes a little bit of work. Whereas with Mongoose, it's kind of a model first in that you create your schemas and your models in JavaScript code. And that's what you use to interact with the database. You would never have to create a diagram like this and then implement it with SQL. And then um, this is a lot more work, honestly. That's, I think that's why uh, the, like Mongo is so popular in JavaScript stacks because it's less work. Doesn't mean it's better, it's just less work. Uh, yeah, so GameStep is asking, is Kinex better than SQLize? What's the difference? So let's, let's talk about that right now. So I mentioned Kinex is a schema builder um, and I'll show you an example. Um, Connects lets you do things like this. So you can say connects.select from books. And this JavaScript code gets turned into this SQL code. So it is a query builder in that the code you write with JavaScript is very, very close to the actual SQL code that gets generated. Whereas something like SQLize, 
sequelize, uh, is known as an ORM or an object relational mapper. And this is much higher level. So you in, in sequelize, you really never write anything that looks like a SQL query. You call methods on objects and that's how you add things to the database or update things. Instead of saying like update where, you'll just set a property on an object and say dot save. So that's the major difference is SQLize is an object relational mapper. Um, let's see if we can see an example of just like a simple query. Modeling a table, querying. Okay, user dot find all. It's very uh, human readable and very abstracted because really what's happening here is like select star from user and that's 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 the underlying SQL code that would get implemented uh, user dot create and you pass in an object um, whereas with SQL that's like insert into table these values um, so SQLize is much higher level and connects is much lower level um, and what I like about Connects is it allows us to do migrations. So I'll talk about that in a second. But basically, uh, we can have JavaScript code that describes how the database changes over time. Um, whereas with SQL, you can do that. Um, but it's also very model heavy in that you're um, creating these models that represent the tables. And if you need to change the database, potentially you update the model and you can sync it, sync it with the database. Whereas Connects is much more explicit where you literally say, add this column or drop this column. Um, and what I like about that is I, I have much more fine grained control over the SQL database. And in the future, if we want to change the types of these columns, if we want to add new tables or new relationships, uh, we can do that with Connects migrations. Um, there are a lot of other ORMs out there. I'll mention that Objection.js is my favorite JavaScript ORM, um, and it actually uses Connects.js under the hood. And um, I really like this. And when we implement the application, like the API, I will most likely use Objection.js. But Objection is cool because it doesn't care how the database was actually implemented. It just needs to know how to communicate with that database. Um, so eventually, I'll probably use Objection. But for now, we're just going to use uh, connects, which is much lower level and is, is going to allow us to uh, model the tables. <laughs> uh, there's a problem with polls on Twitch. Twitch chat only shows chats that were sent after some connected to the stream. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think we're, we were doing this straw poll thing, though. Looks like Postgres is winning. That's good. Hello, Mr. Boyson. Hello, Ashwarya. <laughs> um, thanks for the follow, Rockman. Do I need to watch the previous video first? Um, you don't have to. I mean, I basically did an explanation of, of what we created here. But if you want better uh, reasoning for why we did the things we did, the, we did here, you could watch the last video because I explained a lot of that. Um, are states identified by their short codes or full names? I'll probably go with short codes. Yeah. Why do we care about the manufacturer's address in the first place? What if I want to create a map of where all of my canned goods come from? I could create, um, I, I could use that information to store it. Um, also, if this were actually like a store inventory system, you would potentially want to keep track of your manufacturers so that you can place orders to those manufacturers. Um, also, based on the location of the manufacturer, you could determine like shipping time and stuff like that. Um, for a home system, it's probably not that important. But you could do some interesting things like how many of my products are from X manufacturer. So you can really see like, oh, wow, most of that food is made by one place. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you mean by data dictionary. And hello, Merchan. Welcome. Uh, can I create a trigger that soft uh, does deletes a soft deleted entry after 30 days? Yeah, you absolutely could. Um, and that's what some systems do as well. So initially you do uh, a soft delete or an archive. And then you have some sort of system process that runs on a, on a regular interval that decides, um, okay, if anything has been deleted for 30 days, we're actually going to delete it for real and remove it from the system. But you still potentially have the issue where all of the related things will need to get deleted as well, and you may not want that, but yeah. Uh, ready for lockdown in South Africa. Yeah, I bet that's scary being at home with, with kids. Hope you're doing well. And hello, Destin. And thanks for the follow, uh, Remixer. All right, we're way behind on chat. Let's see. Um, IC Killer says, how do you add many-to-many -many or one-to-one -one relationships with Lucidchart? So right now, all of the relationships I've added are uh, many to uh, are one-to-many. Um, I actually don't think I have any many-to-many -many relationships. Yeah, we don't actually have any join table. Well, no. 
related item is technically a many to many relationship. Um, but if you want to do a uh, many to uh, or one, let's say we want to do a one to one relationship, you can click on this and then you can just change how it gets connected. So I'm going to change the connection point to be that. And this is now a one to one relationship. Um, but I'm actually going to keep this as one to many. But yeah, you can see all the different possible things you have in here. Um, and you can look up uh, NED relationship diagram symbols to know what all of these means. This is like zero um, or many. This is one or zero or more, one or more, uh, one to one. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't know the database driver yet. It's most likely going to be Postgres. I'll let a few more votes come in if you haven't voted yet. Um, but we're probably going to use Postgres for this. Honestly, the only the only difference, at least right now, is how I set up the Docker container, because uh, modeling the database is going to be exactly the same, regardless if we're using uh, MySQL or Postgres. Um, the cool thing about the Connect site is you can choose your database, and uh, then when you look at the different uh, query builder functions, it'll show you the syntax for that particular database. So with Postgres, you make queries with double quotes. Whereas with MySQL, you make queries with backticks. Um, and ConnectJS handles that under the hood, depending on uh, what database you're using. <laughs> MySQL, please. <laughs> um, and hello, Diversic. Yeah, I'm safe. I'm doing good. Um, yeah, Robin has a good point. You need to use some API so that you can scan the barco barcodes to autofill up everything. Absolutely. That's the plan. Eventually, we'll have a mobile app where you can just scan it. It can do a lookup. Check to see if that manufacturer exists. If it doesn't, insert it into the table. Yeah, all that good stuff. But that's that's down the line. <laughs> um, what do I think is a non-trivial OOP project? Uh, probably a, um, I was going to say like a bookstore. That's really generic, though. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So we we're storing um, SKU, which should be the barcode. Robin. And thanks for the follow, Bash X. Thanks for the follow, Winden. Um, we had a developer that made an app with Microsoft SQL using nothing but stored procedures. Yeah, and so like that's that's another thing about people that are that are dedicated SQL developers is a lot of times people have the opinion that you ha actually shouldn't let your applications run direct SQL code at all. You should create stored procedures, which are basically like SQL functions. And you should only allow your applications to call those stored procedures. I'm not going to implement it that way. We're actually going to write JavaScript code that runs the SQL queries, but yeah. OK. Um, Mashoot says, I love your work. Just started developing my skills. Your channel helped a lot. That's good to hear. Welcome. Uh, in which case, you should choose soft delete. <laughs> That's true. So with uh, the GDPR, um, people can request that you delete items, and you would have to implement deletion if that uh, is the case. All right, we're 10 minutes behind on chat. I'm sorry to say it, but we're gonna we're gonna just we're gonna scroll past all these, <laughs> um, and ask your question again if I'm if I'm looking at the chat. And let's uh, acknowledge. Uh, thanks for the follow, Remixer. Thanks for the follow, BashX. Thanks for the follow, ZXQW. Thanks for the follow, Felifant. Thanks for the follow, Mendaxis. Thanks for the follow, Lucario. Thanks for the follow, Koelev. <laughs> thanks for the follow, Seems Like Mario. Thanks for the follow, Crow Muki. Uh, thanks for the follow, Sir Ball. Thanks for the follow, Chubby Elf. And thanks for the follow, Monks FPS. Much appreciated. Um, is there any study that shows the performance increment by using primary keys? Sick coding. <laughs> you stop it. We're about to write some code. <laughs> um, what is the rec database I recommend? Either MySQL or Postgres. So it's because, uh, or uh, MySQL or MariaDB. They're both open source. You can get up and going uh, locally. Um... Let's see. Next.js front end soon. Hey, I probably should. And it's not it's actually not that hard to get set up. Um, all right, I probably missed a lot of questions. I'm sorry, but we gotta go. We gotta not go. We gotta get going. <laughs> okay, it looks like Postgres won. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start up uh, my Docker on my machine, and we're gonna look up the Postgres Docker machine. Oh no, I need an update. Uh remind me later. Alright. <laughs> Docker Postgres. Do, 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 do. Um, this is seems to be the official Postgres Docker image. Um, I probably want to, yeah, I want to use a uh, Docker Compose. 
um, something like this. Using the Postgres image, we can set the Postgres password. What is adminner? I've never heard of adminner. Oh, this is like the PHP my admin for uh, for uh, Postgres. That's pretty cool. Maybe we'll set that up. Yeah, why not? Okay, let's do this. So uh, directly from the Docker web page, we can see that they're describing this YAML file. Here's what we're going to do. Um, in VS Code, let's go ahead and create a folder for our, our um, let's call it backend. Um, and in that folder, we're going to create a Docker compose dot YML. So this is a file that you can use with Docker uh, to basically create several different or, or spin up several different containers that all communicate with each other. So uh, what we're doing here is we're spinning up a uh, container or we're spinning up a container from this Postgres image called DB. Um, and that's going to spin up our Postgres uh, container. That's great. And then there's this other uh, container called adminner, which uses the adminner image, which gives us a, basically a, a web page where we can look at the tables that have been created inside of the database um, and do different things like that. So that's great. Um, one thing we need to do is we need to expose the port of the database um, to my system so that way I can connect to it directly. Um, and I just need to make sure that I don't have Postgres running on my machine. Oh no, brew services stop Postgres. Because there are different ways you could do this. You could have Postgres or MySQL installed directly on your development machine. Um, and if you do that, then um, you, anybody else that, that runs your code needs to make sure that they have it installed locally. But if we set this up with a Docker container, when someone else pulls the code down, they don't need to have Postgres installed locally. They can just spin up these containers and they're ready to go. Uh, and thanks for the follow, the Sof, the Sof, Sifo Dias. <laughs> um, PHP MyAdmin has a much better UI than Adminner. Does PHP MyAdmin support Postgres though? Yeah. Um, it potentially matters for certain things that we might have to do raw. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, I mean, technically we could have just used SQLite if, if that's the case, but yeah, add minor is an advertising. <laughs> uh, use the Docker generator VS code has, I've never used that before. Um, and Pranjal says, uh, why is it said that MongoDB is the best fit for Node.js? I, I think just because it's easier than SQL. I think that's really, oh, PHG admin. Okay, we're going to use what they, what they describe in the Docker, uh, in the Docker docs here. Um, and so this also tells us what environment variables we have available to us. So there's Postgres password. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to actually pull this in from a .env file. Um, because whenever we start to create our Node.js application and whenever we uh, set up uh, connects to do the migrations, it can use these environment variables to connect to the database. So we're going to need the Postgres password. That's going to be it. Um, and then I believe in a Docker file, you can do something like this. Hope that works. Cool. What's the best thing about a Boolean? Even if you're wrong, you're only off by a bit. That's good. <laughs> and oh, hello, Greg. Welcome. Are there any character limits on the fields in the table? Um, you can add them. So in, in the diagram that we created, we didn't set any limits directly. Anything that was text, we just set them as text. But when I implement them, I most likely will. Uh, and in, data, in SQL databases, this is known as a var char or variable character limit. And typically, you can set that this field cannot have anything longer than 50 characters. Uh, and we'll do that when we're creating all of the models. Uh, how do I know what to extrapolate into a table? Um, I would say watch my last video where I talk about that. Um, but essentially, each table represents an entity. Um, you could think of each table representing a tab in a spreadsheet. Uh, anything that you would need to have multiple rows, of, multiple instances of, that is a table. 
how do I access local Postgres database from outside and uh, for current operations? So what I'm about to show is we'll be accessing a Postgres database inside of a Docker container, but um, you can use this exact same method if you, if you have it running locally. Can anyone confirm if I have the right syntax here for my uh, my Dottie and V? Postgres user, we'll call this uh, admin. Uh, Postgres DB, uh, we'll call this uh, inventory app. Um, so what I'm doing is I have this Dottie and V file, and I have all of the actual values in here, and then in my Docker Compose. I'm setting these environment variables for the specific container so that it will look at my .env. <laughs> uh, oh, it's do I'm missing the dollar sign. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Um, OK, so we have Postgres password, Postgres user, Postgres database. Um, and then. Yeah, I think we're going to want to set up a volume. So here's the thing about using a, uh, a Docker container um, or a Docker container for a database. If your database is actually storing things and that Docker container goes down, you lose all of the data. So we will want to set up a, um, a volume so that any data that's stored in the Docker container will be stored in that volume. And that way, if we bring it down or bring it back up, you all are silly. Uh, silly. If we bring it down or bring it back up, uh, we'll always have access to that data. Uh, so I'm just going to create a folder called Docker data, and then inside of that, create a, a folder called DB data, and then inside of that, create a file called uh, .git keep, so that it actually keeps that directory. Um, and then we can set up a volume. Um, and we just want to say this should be uh, docker data slash db data. <laughs> um, and so what we're saying here is that inside of this Docker container, uh, var lib PostgreSQL data, this is where all of the database data is actually stored. We're going to map that to this actual folder on my local machine. So that should be good. Um, what else? I think we're good to go. Let's see if this works. Um, does anyone know? You get bonus points. What is the default Postgres port? If you can tell me before I can find it, you get ten coding garden points. Five fifty-four thirty-two. Thank you. <laughs> um, so here's another thing we can do: uh, is we can say uh, ports, and we're gonna map port fifty-four thirty-two on my machine to 5432 inside of the container. Um, OK. I think, I think, I think we've done everything correctly. Um, we may need to look up adminner. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> Everyone has it. They Google, that's fine. I didn't Google it. <laughs> Nice, yeah. Uh, 5432 is the default port. Everyone's got it. Great work, everyone. Great work. And thanks for the follow, uh, Tony Man. <laughs> Five, four, three, two. Yeah, you all get 10 points. Uh, and thanks for the follow, Ali Cabinham. Um, OK. A a adminner is the web console. It's like PHP my admin. And I was thinking we need to set these environment variables as well. But I guess not, because you'll probably just enter the username and password. Um, and so by default, when I start this up, it should look at the .env and pull in um, this info. So let's try it. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to say docker compose up is invalid. <laughs> uh, I did mean volume. So this should be volumes. All right. Docker compose up. It's going to pull those images. <laughs> um, so it'll pull the PG image and the adminner image. Uh, they don't work because of security issues. So uh, it would be very possible to uh, cross-site script my my chat manager here uh, if you were to able to add that stuff. Oh, why no depend on? You're, you're a good point, Win32, zero day. Uh, we can add that. So um, in 
uh, is it depends on, I think? But in a YAML file, you can say uh, adminner depends on DB. So that way, this container will not start up until this container has started up. Um, let's kill it. So I'm going to bring them down. Depends on should be an array. Cool. <laughs> um, so you can see that this this DB data folder, it just got filled up with a bunch of stuff. That's all of the internal files that Postgres uses to keep track of data. Uh, and now it says that adminner is listening on port 8080. So if I go to port 8080 in my browser, we should see. Um, oh, that overtook my chat manager, though. <laughs> I should have I should have mapped it to a different port. Uh, all right, I'm going to map it to a different port. Kill it. Uh, we're going to map it to port 8090. This is a very big button. Yes. <laughs> Great work. OK. Um, all right. 8090? There we go. So uh, we can say the system is Postgres. The server is DB. Um, because this is inside of the internal Docker network. The username is admin, password admin, in database is inventory db. Login. Inventory db does not exist. Okay. Um, did I call it the right thing? Inventory app. Let's see. Inventory app. Login. No password supplied. Admin. Okay, cool. It works. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, adminner, best UI ever. You're right. Um, uh, having your credentials as admin, admin is likely putting a gate before an open field with no fence. <laughs> it's a good point. Um, but uh, this is pulling it in from my environment variables. So if I were to deploy this in production with Kubernetes or something like that, I obviously would have a much, much more, much, much more secure uh, username and password. Okay, so that's awesome. Um, so the Postgres database is running now, and we can start connecting to it and creating tables. So I'm going to leave that running. Um, technically, you can run a Docker Compose in the background, but I'm going to leave it running so we can see the logs as things happen. And then um, in a new tab, we're going to start doing all of our connect stuff. So uh, I'm going to npm init this uh, folder um, so that way we can install our, our Node.js dependencies. And then I'm going to install uh, connects. Um, I'll also need to install the database driver. So you can see in getting started with connects, uh, let's see, the client, um, you specify which client connects should use. And so in Node.js uh, with connects, well, in Node.js with Postgres, we use this module called PG. It is the most popular one. Um, there are probably other ones, but this is the one we want. So I'm also just going to say npm i uh, PG. Crowns. <laughs> yes, Corona is uh, a crown. <laughs> Uh, and thanks for the follow, uh, Void. Much appreciated. That face when the username is more secure than the password. Yeah. Please use PG admin four. I guess I could. I kind of just want to. <laughs> I want to get going. Um, and the for whatever reason, the official Postgres Docker documentation pointed me to adminner. So I'm fine with that. We're not really going to use it for much. We can use it to verify that the tables got created, and we can look at their schema and stuff like that. And thanks for the follow, uh, Persis. How often do I nuke and format my machine? Um, maybe once a year? A little longer than that? <laughs> That's not the clear command. OK, so um, we now have a package JSON. We have our dependencies connects. And we have our dependencies PG. So the first thing we'll do is we'll create a connects file, which uh, describes how we connect to the database. Um, and actually, I'm also going to install uh, .env because we want to be able to read in that .env file to use it inside of uh, Node.js. Hashtag switch back to Firefox. There's just there's several apps that I haven't logged into that I would need to log into again. I don't know. <laughs> you found a new editor for me to use? That sounds like a preface to a Rickroll. So I'm not going to listen to that. 
Um, okay. <laughs> Petition for CJ to switch back to Firefox. Um, okay, so we have dot env connects in pg. Um, we will do npx connects uh, init, I think. There we go. And that's going to create this connects file, which tells connects how to connect to our database. So let's look at it. I don't know what's better, the stream content or the peer. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Limgi. Um, okay, so that creates this file, which describes how to connect to the database. Um, and um, one thing we'll do is up at the top here is we'll bring in our .env file so that we can pull in the uh, Postgres password, Postgres user, and Postgres DB so we can use that to connect to the database. Now, the connects file um, describes different ways of connecting to the database. Um, and so you can have different environments. So you can say in development, we're using SQLite, but in uh, staging and production, we're using Postgres or MySQL. Um, for now, I am actually going to remove all of them except for development. And we're gonna use this information here. Um, just a bunch of extra stuff. It's pretty much all we need. So client I'll say is a PG. Uh, the database is going to be uh, process.env. PostgresDB. Uh, the user is going to be uh, process.env. Uh, Postgres user. And the password is going to be process.env. Postgres. Is it PW or is it password? It's password. Cool. Um, while I'm thinking about it, I'm actually going to go ahead and install uh, ESLint because look, look at these crazy people. They're lining up the uh, property assignments. I hate it. <laughs> I, I like to keep it like that, but uh, I'm going to install um, ESLint for that. This is a dev dependency. I just wanted to try this. <laughs> awesome. Good job, Blizzard Keeper. Uh, random question. What is the main purpose of a service account? Lock down a user, create a user, uh, give permissions to a group of users, allow for service to first service interaction with GCP. <laughs> Are you doing homework? I would probably say uh, number four. Um, so like if you have some sort of internal process that needs to do something, it's good to have a service account so that the stuff is happening on behalf of that service instead of happening on behalf of some user. What theme? <laughs> um, if you do exclamation mark theme, you'll get a, a link to the theme that I'm using. It's, this is a new one. I haven't used this one on stream before. Um, I think lined up looks neater. Yeah, yeah you're right, but uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then we're going to uh, create our um, ESLint file. Uh, for me, it's morning. It's only 8.48 AM. Okay, we're going to set up our ESLint file, and we'll be good to go. Am I using format on save? I don't know. Maybe? Hello, Code with Dinesh. Welcome. <laughs> uh, Roberto says, what about developing an API in another language and then building an application which essentially only does requests to the API? That's absolutely possible. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I like Node.js, and that's what I build my APIs, APIs with. But technically, you could build them with any backend language um, as long as they provide, uh, like, JSON. Any front-end application could communicate with them. Hello, Diego. Welcome. Omega lol. <laughs> Great work. <laughs> uh, have I heard of the carry coding standards? I have not. OK. Um, so we have ESLint. One thing I learned recently is I believe you can say uh, root true. And what that allows is the connects file to let's see, is it working? Or is it root false? Maybe I need to reload VS Code. Whoa. Oh. 
How is that Turkish? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so you, I mean, you could do like any sort of uniform API, whether it's JSON or XML or any of that good stuff. Well, that's pretty cool. And thanks for the follow, uh, Muzam. <laughs> um, I haven't worked with Python much. I worked with Python like five years ago, but it was mainly for like data analysis. I really didn't build any APIs with it. My ESLint is an error set. I see that. I wonder why. Yeah, fail to load plugin import. I think that's because. So is this root? False, maybe? Mm. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? <laughs> like, I learned this the other day. Like, if you have a nested folder that has an ESLint file inside of it, um, you can put this root property on there, and then it makes it so that it doesn't have to be in the top folder. All right, I'm going to Google it. Oh, uh, I was using a razor blade for uh, my streaming computer. So I actually have a, a multi-computer setup. Um, I use a, a MacBook. This is still a MacBook. I've always used a MacBook um, as my coding computer, but the HDMI goes to a capture card that's plugged into a Windows machine. Um, but yeah, I used to use this razor blade because my streaming setup had to be portable, but now I just have a dedicated uh, gaming desktop computer that handles everything. Um... Does anyone know what I ta I'm talking about? <laughs> All right. Um, and hello, Loco. Welcome. Thanks for the follow, uh, Rayson. That huge NPM is joining. Uh, yeah. Okay. Wrong working directory. I really, f I did this the other day. I really feel like it's just the word root. Thanks for the, yeah, thanks for the follow, Rayson, Diego. Thanks for the follow, and Afro Maine. Yeah, you're finally, welcome, welcome everyone. <laughs> um, I, I shouldn't be spending time on this. Don't use ESLint. <laughs> I mean, the, the other solution, check it, is all I have to do is open VS Code inside of that backend folder. Um, and it will just work. Get rid of that for now. It should work. Yeah, see, it works. I don't know. We'll fix that some other time. <laughs> hey, good morning, Brooks. What's up? Um, okay, so we have our connects file. Uh, we've told it how to connect to the database. Um, and now we can start creating uh, migrations and such. So uh, one thing that I like to do is I like to create a folder uh, let's call it DB, and this is where I store all of my migrations and all of my seeds. Because uh, the thing to think about is eventually this folder is going to have uh, like my, my backend code for my API and Express and all that good stuff. And so I want to make sure that the, the top level isn't too crowded. So in this DB folder, I'm going to create a folder called um, uh, migrations. And uh, migrations are the things that will actually uh, change the structure of the database. Um, can I explain indexing in a database, when to use it and when not to use it? If you want to search on a specific column, that column should be indexed. Otherwise, your queries are going to be very, very slow. That's the main, that's the main reason. Um, if you're doing lookups by a column very often, you should probably index that column. Um, okay, so we have this folder called migrations. And now we can create our very first migration. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a single migration. I'm going to call it the initial migration that describes this entire structure. Like technically you could do separate migration files, um, but I like to do it all in one because we can create the tables in order of their dependencies. Um, because you'll, you'll notice that certain tables will need to be created first uh, because their depend other tables are dependent on them. So uh, you can see that the item table is dependent on the uh, user table and the item type table and the manufacturer table. So I actually can't create this table until those other tables exist. So in this one big migration file, I'm going to create the tables in the order that they need to be created. Um, and that will be our initial migration, essentially. So here's what we do. Um, in the folder here, I can do npx connects migrate make and then you give it a name and I'm going to call this initial 
Um, oh, and you'll notice I, I forgot to, to, to set up one thing. So um, you'll see that it actually created the migrations folder at the root. I don't want that. I'm going to delete that. Um, and in our connects file, I believe we can set where the migrations are. Folder, maybe? I don't know. I'm going to have to go look at the docs to make sure I'm doing this right. But basically, I wanted to put the migrations in that folder, not, not at the root. Um, so let's just search for migration folder, folder. Is it directory? Oh, here we go. I think. OK. We are looking for um, configuration options. Migrations, table name, read the migrations section. Um, migrations directory. So we can specify it from the command line, but I want to do it in the um, configuration file. Custom migration source. Sort of. <laughs> What's happened? I can use directory. All right, let's just try it. <laughs> um, directory. OK, I'm, it's weird that I can't actually find that. Um, I, I do work from home today. I'll be streaming for roughly one more hour. Um, so hopefully we can get this database implemented in about an hour. Um, all right, let's try that again. And there we go. It put it in the right folder. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, where is it at, Andrew? Can you tell me in the docs? Um, is it just the migrations API? Query builder, schema builder. Migration API. Here we go. Directory, a relative path to the directory containing the migration files. <laughs> yeah, I, I basically will never ever click a link that uh, Andrew provides, but I appreciate it, Andrew. Um, um, that's it, cool, <laughs> we figured it out. So what that did was it created this file in the migrations folder um, and with migrations, there, there's this concept of up and a concept of down. So the up is what should happen when we're actually creating uh, this database. Um, and that is we're basically going to create all of those tables and create the relationships between those tables. Uh, the down in this scenario is to just drop all of the tables. Cool. So what I'm going to do right now is uh, I'm going to change these to be an async function um, because um, the query building methods to create tables and, and add columns and things like that, those are uh, asynchronous. They return a promise. So we're going to do a bunch of async await stuff inside of here. Uh, anonymous functions. Yeah, it's good and bad at the same time. There's a lot of good stuff in there. It's Some stuff is hard to find. Hello, John. Hello, Cheyenne. Welcome. Is Galvanize the last time I used Connects? No, I use uh, Connects at my, at my job. I use it in production. See you later, Destin. Thanks for hanging out. Um, and thanks for the follow, Crusader. Thanks for the follow. Anyone else that followed? <laughs> um, OK, so this is our migration file. One thing that I like to do is uh, create a file that contains the names of all of my tables. Um, so let's create a source directory. And inside of that, I'm going to have a folder called constants. And inside of that, I'm going to have a file that's just called table names. Um, now, you absolutely don't have to do this. Like technically, when I'm creating a table, I can just pass in a string. But if we're reusing table names, um, I like those to be in one place so that I don't have any typos. Um, and so we're going to do that here. Um, so we'll say module.exports is an object. And we're going to put the names of our tables in here. So let's go to our diagram. Um, and now what we have to do is we have to decide which tables do we create first. I am going to create 
the user table first because it doesn't have any foreign key references. So you'll notice there's a primary key and then just the properties. Now, um, because there are no foreign key references, this table is not dependent on any other table, meaning I can create it first. So we're going to create this one first. Um, and so on my table names, I'm just going to have user as user, just like that. Um, and what I can do now is in this migration file is I'm going to bring in the table name constants so that I can use them. Um, so we'll say uh, table names equals require, go up a directory, go up a directory, go into the source directory, go into the constants, and then grab the table names file. Um, cool. So now that I have table names, um, VS Code should actually do some autocomplete. So if I do uh, table names dot, I can see that I have access to users. So this is the main reason that I create these constants is I won't have typos with the names of the tables. Um, and so now we can uh, actually create the user table. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say await connects dot create table. You pass in the table name. So I'll say table names dot user. And then you get a callback function um, that allows you to specify all of the columns on the table. So this, this does return a promise because it's going to need to actually run the SQL code that creates the table. Um, we pass in the table name. Now, again, I could have just passed in user like that. But like I said, I like to uh, prevent typos. So I create a, a lookup uh, object. And now inside of here, we can actually uh, describe the table. Um, and the way that works is you just say table dot, and then you can specify um, the column type. So I'm going to say table dot increments. This is built into um, connects to automatically create a column that is an ID, that is the primary key, and that, that is indexed. Um, <laughs> sorry for spamming. <laughs> no worries. So uh, if we do table dot increments, it's automatically going to add that ID column. Let's just look up uh, increment here. And right now we're working with schema building. So in SQL, there's two different concepts. There's this idea of a data definition language. So this is the SQL code that actually creates the tables and, and creates the relationships. Um, and then there's the other abbreviation or acronym, which I forgot, which is uh, SQL code that selects from the tables and inserts into the tables. Does anyone know the other abbreviation? DML, data modification language? <laughs> Um, SQL DML. Data manipulation language. That that has the nice ring to it. Cool. Yeah, so there's data definition language, which is what we're doing right now. And then there's data manipulation language, which we'll do later to insert things into the table and things like that. Thank you, Buggy Man, for that. And thanks for the follow, uh, Elmo Pindor. Um, good call. Yeah, so what Andrew is showing us is actually uh, pretty sweet. Um, is once we do this, we'll actually get typings. So how can I select it all? I can't select it all. Can I select it all? Um, but once we get typings, when we do table dot, it'll tell us all the things that's available to us. So let's do this. Um, well, we need to get rid of all of that. And we need to get rid of these. I could have just typed it out. I really could have just typed it out. Would that give us the typings? How do we get the typings? <laughs> it's a Rickroll, is it? No. <laughs> and hello, Opti, welcome. Uh, Exports.up, this, this is a connects thing. So the idea is that this function is going to be the one that runs whenever we run the migration. And this is the function that runs if we ever try to roll back a migration. Um, and thanks for the follow, uh, Fetal. Yeah. Hello, Shashika. Put it before exports.up. Mm. All right, 
you you work on that syntax. <laughs> We're just gonna keep doing things. <laughs> Um, cool. And so this will, like I mentioned, this creates an ID table. Now, uh, what I like to add to it is the fact that this column cannot be null. So you can say not nullable. And um, this should, it, it's showing. Um, and so that makes it so that this column can never be null. Um, and we want that because it's a primary key. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else we want on there? I think, I think that's mainly it. And so by default, this creates a column called ID. If you wanted to call it anything else, like a user ID, which you probably shouldn't because this is the user table, um, you could pass it in there. But by default, that creates the ID column. So that one's good to go. Uh, next up, we want the email. So we can say uh, table dot um, text email. And uh, this is not nullable. This is also uh, unique. Uh, because you can't have two users with the same email, um, and instead of table.txt, we'll probably also we'll probably set the maximum length. What do you all think? What should be the maximum length of a uh, of an email in our system? Two hundred fifty-five characters? Is that too much? <laughs> um, coding. <laughs> so what I'm looking up right now is. Um, the table commands, because there is table.txt, um, but you could also do table.string, I believe. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, does a varchar 255. 20 characters, 603 characters, 120 characters. <laughs> Are there any limits? 128? Let's see, uh, email character limit, 384 characters. What's the maximum length of a valid email address? Must not exceed 254 characters. There we go. <laughs> uh, so what we can do is we can say uh, table.string uh, email uh, 254. So, <laughs> and, and technically, uh, if you just do string uh, by itself, I believe that defaults to varchar, yeah, it defaults to varchar 255, which is just one away from 254. So technically I could do that and the max length would be 255, but I'm gonna specify it. Um, so that's great. What else do we need? Uh, we need the user's name. Um, I think similarly, we're just going to use the default uh, 255 characters. Um, the name is not nullable, but the name does not have to be unique. So two users can have the same name. That's totally fine. All right, let's try it. I think I potentially need the type for um, table. I actually am, um, I'm interested in finding the right type. Options, table options. Is table options exported? Looks like that type isn't exported. I don't know. Weird. Okay. Regardless, <laughs> let's just let's just build the tables. We don't have much time. Um. Okay. So we have the name. Uh, we also need the password. Um, what should be the maximum possible password length? So one, one interesting thing uh, about Postgres is it actually does have the text type, um, which doesn't have a limit. Um, and uh, so it could be any, any length. Um, I, I don't want to restrict, I mean, people that have, want to have like a hundred character length password, like why should I prevent that from happening? Um, so, I don't know, let's go. <laughs> 500 characters, realistically. Um, yeah, there is no hashing. You're right. It takes. It definitely takes up more memory. Like if you use the text type, which doesn't have a limit, uh, it's absolutely going to take up more memory. Um, yeah, uncrackable password. So this is the maximum possible length. I'm fine with that. Like, 
<laughs> 500 characters is cool. Um, you would use a password manager. I don't know. It, I mean, it's probably realistic to do like 100, but again, I don't want to prevent people from creating very secure passwords. Um, and then what else do we want? We want a last login, which is just a date time. So we'll say table dot, uh, date time, last login. Um, and this is also, um, well, this actually can be nullable because if you create a user and they've never logged in before, this could be null. Um, windows has a maximum password length of 127 characters. <laughs> storing passwords is plain text, no. So uh, the actual storing of the passwords uh, is in an application implementation. So with Node.js, we will use bcrypt before we insert those passwords into the database. Um, there are native modules for these different database systems that could technically uh, encrypt the passwords, but I do it at the application level, not at the, the database level. Um, okay, so... <laughs> All right, I'm going to add, well, what's the Windows limit? 127. We're going to do it as 127. <laughs> uh, when do we roll back? So we would roll back if we uh, if we want to undo some of the migrations that have happened. So uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, This is the only table I'm going to create right now. And um, I'll show you how this works and, and see if it actually does work. So what we'll do is in the down, we want to do the opposite of creating this table. So 10 coding garden points in the chat. If you can tell me what's the opposite of creating a table. And thank you for the, the follow Abdel, uh, Abdel, Abdelima. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Connects.schema.create table. Drop a table. Yes. <laughs> Great work, everyone. So uh, in the down, we will drop this table that we just created. Now, uh, I had that wrong. This should be connects.schema.create table. Now that I've done that, Oh, wow, look at the autocomplete. <laughs> so we can see um, all of the possible uh, column types that we can create. That's great. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for figuring that out. Uh, yeah, <laughs> drop. So um, in the down, we want to drop this user table. So I'm going to say await connects.schema dot drop table table names dot user. Cool. And so if I migrate my database, that's going to create this table. And then if for whatever reason I want to roll that back, this will run, which will actually drop the table. Uh, we're using Docker, so I didn't have to use my local instance of uh, Postgres. Docker is running inside of the container. OK, so let's uh, let's try to run this. Let's see what happens. So we're going to do um, npx connects migrate colon latest. And what this does is this will look in that migrations folder. And uh, any migrations that have not yet been run will run against the database. And so I'm actually going to add this as an NPM script. I'm going to call this uh, migrate. Um, so I can just do uh, NPM run migrate. And that's going to try to do connects migrate latest. It says batch one run, one migrations. Um, <laughs> and so now if we go back to this admin thingy and we refresh, Look at that. We have some tables. This is good. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, you're right. You're totally right. Uh, we want to add timestamps, too. But th this is a good good way to talk about uh, rolling back, because we're going to roll back, so that way we can add the migrations. Technically, we could have added a new migration, um, but I prefer to create my initial database structure with everything we need. And then once my app is in production, then we start to add new migrations. <laughs> it was all planned, yeah. But um, so now we're using this adminner thing, and we can see that multiple tables got created. So for one, there's this connects migrations table, and this is actually um, what connects uses to keep track of which migrations have run. So if we select all the data, you can see that there's one entry, and it actually has the name of the migration file that ran. Um, and so next time, if I were to try to run uh, migrate again, it would say already up to date because it looks in that folder and sees that. Uh, this this migration has already been run. Great. Um, and then we can see there's the migration log. It uses that internally. But then we see the user table. So if we click this, we can see what got created. So uh, ID is an integer. It auto increments. Uh, email is uh, character varying. Um, and there's an index on uh, a primary index on ID. And there's a unique index on email. Um, I'm curious why this isn't showing us um, like not nullable.
Oh, you're right. Yeah. So in the script, I don't need NPX. We can get rid of that. <laughs> and if we run it again, it should say already up to date. Great. And thanks for the follow bottlenecked. Um, who asked that question? What language? Yeah, Opti, this is uh, this is uh, JavaScript, no JS. So the library we're using is called Connex. Um, and this is the library that allows us to create the tables and, and add new columns and things like that. Um, and then we're using Postgres, which is just running inside of a Docker container. Um, OK, but the table got created. That's great. <laughs> uh, but what if I want to roll that back? What if I accidentally created the table in, a, in the wrong way? Um, I can roll back my migrations. So I'm going to add another um, script here called rollback. And we'll say connects migrate rollback. And what rollback will do is it will roll back the last migration. So if we look back at that migrations table, right now there's only one migration that has run. There's only the initial migration. So when I do rollback, it's going to roll back this initial migration. Eventually, like in the future, when I have a ton of migrations, rollback is only going to roll back the last one that ran. Um, but for now, that is just technically one. <laughs> and thanks for the follow uh, draw. Anchor uh, shows null, not nullable. Did we see that? Oh, I see. Yeah. So uh, last login says that this column can be null. And because email and name and password don't show null, that means that they cannot be null. Thank you for that. Uh, not that it matters, but your up function doesn't need to be async. Uh, it it will in a second because um, I'm going to be creating multiple tables in here, and I need to wait for one of them to be created before I create the next. So it, right now it doesn't make sense, but once I have more in there, it will. Um, and so now I'm going to roll back. We're going to do npm run rollback, and that's going to run the down, which should have dropped the table. That's going to run this. And if we look back over here, and we look at our table, we we'll got to refresh. The user's table is gone. It's not there anymore because we dropped it. And if we look in migrations, there are no longer any migrations listed uh, because we rolled them back. So that's great. Um, now we'll add the rest of the stuff. Thanks for the follow, Fade and Nold. Uh, and uh, ZZ Art is asking, how do you connect to Postgres in Node? Uh, we're using the PG module. So. Uh, PG is a module we're connecting directly to Postgres. Technically, you could use PG and just issue it SQL commands directly. Uh, connects is a wrapper on top of that that gives us these nice um, JavaScript functions for creating tables and querying the database. So we're using connects for that. Uh, is it a good idea to example, uh, for example, to Dockerize and Express REST API and your React app as well and have them talk to each other? Um, you can definitely Dockerize the REST API. I don't really like to, do to Dockerize front-end applications, uh, mainly because they have to build constantly. And if that's running in a Docker container, it's just a whole lot slower. Um, but Docker always helps when you're work working with multiple developers because you don't have to um, have your local environment set up in, the, in a very specific way. You can just use the Docker file and you're ready to go. Um, but yeah, I, I typically have my API in a Docker container. Please download a theme for Adminner. Is that a thing? <laughs> what the heck is he doing? Uh, can I? Can you go to 10 fast fingers? I don't know what that means. Hello, Dina True. Uh, the lock table is used internally by Connects when the migrations are running, I believe. You can look at, like, I've never had to touch that table, but I believe it's to tell it that this migration is currently running, so don't run any other migrations, something like that. What are the advantages of creating tables with JavaScript? Um, for one, it's all in one code base. If you have someone that's not totally familiar with SQL, they could look at this code and somewhat deduce what it's doing. Um, I like the fact that my code base is in one language, and I can use my uh, code formatting tools and lint linters and checkers uh, for all of my code versus having to potentially have separate checking tools for like SQL code. Um, and there's, there's just a lot of uh, cool nice functions built into connects that you wouldn't get if you were just writing raw SQL. And because it is JavaScript, you can create a lot of reusable functions. Um, what I'm about to show, actually, is let's do this. Um, we need 
every single table is going to have a created at, updated at, and deleted at column. So we could create a function that automatically adds those columns to any table that we pass into it. And that, that's one of the benefits of using JavaScript. So we'll do that. I don't know anything about InfluxDB. And hello, show star son. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, how do we insert a record when we have primary key and foreign keys? I'll show you that. Not today. In the, probably in the next episode, we'll actually seed the database with some initial data, and I can talk about how do you insert related data. But yeah, we'll do that. Uh, anything? Any ideas of what I can code? Maybe something related to coronavirus? That's all, always pretty popular. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, yes, sir. And thanks for the follow, Ural. Docker or Git? Both. Yeah, both. Use both. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to create this function that says um, add uh, default columns. This takes in the table. Um, and we are going to say uh, table dot uh, date time created at not nullable. And one thing uh, that's cool that you can, well, not, not cool, it, it, it ultimately results in SQL, is we can say uh, default and I believe it's just connects.now. We'll, we'll look this up. But basically, we're saying create this column called created at. And by default, if no data is inserted, um, it is going to um, uh, set the date to be right now. And so we want a created at column. We want an updated at column, which will also default to right now. And we also want a deleted at column which is nullable and does not have a default. So by default, deleted at is null. And if we ever set the deleted at value, then it doesn't show up in our results. Um, let's look at the connect stocks to find that default to. Um, is there a connect dot now? Now? I think I saw it connects.fn.now. There we go. Um, this is what we want. <laughs> Ultimately, this gets turned into SQL code, which will set the date to be the, the date when it was inserted. Yeah, DMN ZTV is saying we do have timestamp and timestamps. Um, I believe a timestamp is is just a time without a date. Let's see though. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, so timestamps um, will automatically add created at and updated at, right? So adds created at and updated at columns on the database, setting each to date time types. When true is passed as the first argument, a timestamp type is used instead. Uh, both columns default to being not null and using the current timestamp when true is passed as the second argument. Um, cool. I think I want a date time rather than a timestamp, though. Right? Don't I? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, with connects, uh, user input is sanitized by default. You don't have to pass in like a separate array uh, to do the parameterization like you do it would would need to do with like the raw SQL driver. Um, yeah, and I, I we always use soft deleting at, at my work. Um, yeah, thanks for the follow thirty two four B two. I don't know. What do you all think? Should, we, should I do date time or should I do timestamp? I think I'll just do timestamps because that basically replaces these two lines of code here. I can just say uh, table.timestamps. Um, and let's see what else it said. So when true is passed as the first argument, um, we want true passed as the second argument. So use the date time type and always and default to now. All right, that should be, that should be it. Uh, but now this function, I can call it right here, like this, and that will automatically add those two columns uh, to the table. And I can reuse this function in the other tables that I create as well. 
Uh, it's not a timestamp. It's actually like a literal date time type. Um, let's try running this and, and see what we get. We can see the type uh, described. So we're going to do uh, npm run migrate. And if we look at it, we should see the type. Current timestamp, current timestamp. Timestamp T's, timestamp time zone, I think is what that stands for. This is a Postgres thing. I don't think I want a time zone though. I want it to be uh, UTC. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so with the GDPR rules, you can do soft deletes, but if someone requests that their data is removed, you will actually have to remove it for sure. <sighs> cool. <laughs> All right, nobody has any opinions. We're going to use timestamps. It's using timestamp Z, which seems weird to me, but that's okay. Uh, we're actually going to roll back because there's more tables that we need to add. Okay, let's keep going. So we have our user table. What's next? So if we look at our diagram, um, we can create any other tables potentially that don't have foreign key references. Um, so things like item type, we could create that table. Um, we could create the state table or the country table. I think I'm gonna go ahead and create the item type table. This is gonna be an easy one. So it's gonna look very similar. So we'll say uh, table names dot item type which doesn't exist yet, we need to add it. So in my constants over here, we're gonna add item type like that. Um, and it has an ID and then it just has a name. And we'll default that to varchar255. Uh, it's not nullable and um, it actually should be unique because item type will be things that we don't want replicated, right? We want um, canned good uh, microelectronics, different things like that. And we wouldn't want to have two entries in this table that both say canned goods. So I think it's okay to say that the name on this, on this table is unique. So that's good. Uh, and thanks for the follow, uh, Advan Reloaded. Yeah. Dana Chu says, my opinion is you should use whatever you think is best. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so do you think Facebook and other apps really delete your data when you request them in certain countries by law, they have to, but you never know. Uh, text is better than varchar in most cases. Uh, people were mentioning earlier that text will, uh, with Postgres, um, potentially take up more memory. And I'm okay. And, and for these columns, I do technically want to limit how much I can store because it doesn't have to be infinite, especially like name. It should really, it's not going to be huge. Canned goods, you know, water bottle. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and thanks for the follow, uh, Marvelur. Okay. Um, so we have item table. I'm just going to color code these as we finish them. Um, let's go with blue on that one. And we'll make the lines blue as well. And then we just created item type. And we'll make it like a pinkish color. And its line will be a pinkish color. Cool. Um, let's go ahead and create any other table that doesn't have a foreign key reference. Let's do state and country. Text is for long content and varchar is for short content by default. Uh, by default, it's 255 uh, characters. Uh, and thanks for the follow gnarly. I still don't understand the difference between varchar and text. It's how it stores it internally, um, because with the text type, there is no limit. You can literally store things of infinite, not infinite, but 
a lot. They can be very, very long. Um, whereas Varchar, by default, will limit. Like the, It's enforced by the database. If you try to insert an email that has 255 characters, because it's longer than the 254 character limit, the database will throw an error and say, you can't do this. If you use the text type, specifically with Postgres, um, then there is no limit on the, the length. MySQL has uh, like short text, medium text, and long text, which is similar. Um, but yeah, that's the thing. How would I implement SQL triggers? I've never done it before. Um, but yeah, I could look into it. Yep. Hello, Fawn. Hello, Cherry. <laughs> uh, we're not using TypeScript, no. Listening to your Twitch, I feel like I'm at university again. Well, it's always fun to learn, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, so with text, you potentially can set a limit. Regardless, let's keep moving. So uh, we have uh, state and country. You know what? Uh, here's another cool thing about using JavaScript. This, this function right here creates a table that has an ID and a unique name. Um, I want to do that same thing for both state and country. So I'm going to create a reusable function. So let's say uh, function... Create name table. <laughs> so this is um, a table that literally only has an ID and a name. And we want to do that right here, or like with this. And we'll pass in the table name. Um, cool. Table name is not in camel case is probably what it's going to say. I'm going to turn off camel case. I, I, for some reason, I really don't, I don't think I have a reason, but in my databases, I like to use underscore case instead of camel case. I just do. Um, yeah. Okay. So now that I have this nice reusable function, um, we're going to uh, call it multiple times. So we're going to await it and we'll say uh, create a uh, name table with uh, table names dot uh, item type. And then we want to do the same thing with uh, country. And we want to do the same thing with uh, state. Cool. So just like that, we have created three tables that all work in a similar way. Um, yeah, we, we could shorten this. Uh, I'm not going to create fu uh, const functions here. But yeah, technically, we could make it an arrow function and do like an instant return. That's OK with me. Um, <laughs> thanks for the follow, CTS, CTS, counts, counts, counts. <laughs> Um, yo, Gnarly, thanks for the follow. What's up? And uh, a varchar is actually an int plus a character array. Hmm. Hmm. And thanks for the follow, Elopen Elopenelumalai. Yeah, and so that's what we're doing here. We're setting the maximum length of these things to save on memory. And also, thanks for the follow, A4U5N6. Yeah, if you do exclamation mark theme, you can see what theme I'm using. I like it. It's called Just Black. It's uh, it's very vibrant and uh, differentiating, which I like about it. And thanks for the follow, Code Show. Thanks for the follow, Monkey Business. You all are great. Thanks for being here. <laughs> theme counter plus plus. <laughs> uh, that's oh, that's a good point. Uh, Brooke says some uh, not all databases respect casing. So if you were to use camel casing, um, so if you use snake case, you don't have to worry about that. I like that. That's why I do it. Not really. I just do it because I prefer it, but that makes sense. <laughs> oh, good morning, Noel. Welcome. And thanks for the follow, Dr. Habits. The size of the string in Bart's. So uh, specifically with this connects library, it is. So if you look at the, um, what was I using? String? Um, the length here is the maximum length of the string. Behind the scenes, it might do something different to change the number of strings in bytes, string in the number of bytes in the string or whatever. Um, but at least for this function that I'm calling, it's setting the, the maximum length of the string. I once changed primary columns uh, to tiny and medium int, and the size of my DB dropped three times. Cool. I mean, if you don't, if you know that you're not going to need that many rows, you can definitely do that. <laughs> um, there, there's a link in the notes, uh, even on Twitch. There's a link. It says show notes. Uh, that's the live database model that I'm working on. Snake case is greater than camel case. <laughs> uh, can, you, can you run this for our entertainment? I won't count it as a Rickroll. Let's just look at the source code, because it is an sh file. Um, 
Let's see. I've only got about 25 minutes left. I think we can do it though. Like we've we've done the bulk of the work, right? We set up the Docker container. We set up the connection file. We're starting to create these reusable functions. We'll have the rest of the database implemented pretty soon. Uh, Rick Astley in your terminal. Guess you just curl it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't want to do it. Um, and I, I will push all this code up to GitHub when we're done. And you can see my my Docker file and and how I set all that up. It plays the audio in the terminal. Okay. Mm, not that. We need the actual URL. I'm, I'm probably about to get hacked, but here we go. Let's turn up the sound. <laughs> um, internal speakers. You've convinced me. Uh, Doc created something super cool. I don't think it was, I don't know if it was this, but he literally created a, a, a thing that could run in your terminal that actually rendered the real time Twitch video view using Unicode colored characters. It was insane. So uh, we curl this file and pipe it into Bash. Let's see what we get. Wow. <laughs> it, play, it, plays the, uh, it plays the music. How? <laughs> um, let's see. Audio GSM and audio raw. Yeah, it's probably detecting my operating system and then actually like literally playing the raw sound. Yeah, on Mac OS, it, yeah, cool. <laughs> All right, hacks. <laughs> and yeah, Brooks, I, I am using a VPN, so. Um, okay, so we have item type, we have state, that one's done now. We'll make that a light purple. We have this one, make that a light green. Um, was there anything else that was as simple as just a named table? Shape, technically we could do shape too. Um, let's make this green and, um, just like that, we can do this with table names dot shape. I need to make sure that, um, shape exists on my table names constants. Cool. So I think this is probably the, the best reason to use something like connects versus just SQL. Cause with SQL, you'll have a lot of repetitive code, right? If you have similar looking tables, um, if you have columns that exist on every single table, you're going to have a lot of repetitive code. It's just the nature of SQL. Uh, whereas with JavaScript, we can create functions and do stuff all day. <laughs> okay. So, uh, we've created all those tables. Now let's go to like one level deeper. So, I believe every other table that we need to create has a foreign key reference. Oh, except for location. Let's go ahead and create location. Um, we will do that right here. So, um, and one thing I'm thinking about is technically because all of these tables don't depend on each other, we could create them simultaneously with a promise.all. Let's just do that because that'll make the, the migration run faster. So I'll say promise.all, pass in an array. Um, and we can do this. Oh, come back. So we could do that and then we could pass all of these in there as well. And it will technically create all of these tables simultaneously, which is totally fine because they don't actually depend on each other. Let's do this. Oh man, what just happened? Promise.all, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll fix that. There's definitely a typo. Uh, promise.all. Cool. So technically all of these tables are going to create it, be created simultaneously. Um, and then one other table that can be created at the same time is the location table. So we'll do that right here. Um, let's create another location. Um, so table names.location. 
what columns do we need? So it needs a name, which should probably be not nullable and unique. Very similar to this. Um, we need a description. The description can be null and doesn't have to be unique. And I'm actually going to limit this to uh, 1,000 characters because maybe we want to write a paragraph. Maybe we want to store it as markdown or something like that. So this will be just a little bit longer than like a, than 255. So we have our description um, and then image URL. Um, now, there is a maximum length of a URL. URL maximum possible length. What's the maximum length of a URL? De facto limit of 2,000 characters. If you keep URLs under 2,000, they'll work virtually any combination of client and server software. <laughs> um, there's those standards around it. Search engines, like you, yeah, regardless. Okay, so we're actually going to say the image URL is uh, up to 2,000 uh, characters. Um, so that creates the location table. Cool. Um, yeah, I think that's good to go. I, there are, we need to create the dependent tables as well. So at this point, we've created um, all tables that do not have any foreign key references. But we will then need to create all of the tables that depend on them. And, and that gets a little more interesting. Um, so stop it. <laughs> Maybe you all did it at the same time. Uh, cool. But one thing I need to change about the, um, the down function is it needs to drop all of these tables, not just the user table. However, um, Am I currently rolled back? So with connects, you could run into a scenario where um, you want to roll back, but the table situation is not the same as when you initially ran the migration. Uh, fortunately, right now, it's not. So right now, I actually don't have a user table. So um, I'm not going to run into an issue. But what I, what I do need to do is drop all of the tables. So let's do this. Uh, await promise.all. Um, we'll have a list of all the tables which is uh, table names dot user table names dot item type country state shape And location. Is that all of them? I have one, two, three, four, five, six tables. One, two, three, four, five, six tables. Okay, and so for each of those, um, we're gonna map that table name to um, connects.schema.drop table with that table name. Cool. All right. Let's try it. <laughs> um, we're going to do connects. No, sorry. Uh, npm run migrate. We have an error. Uh, cannot read property create table of undefined on line 11. What did I mess up? Oh, I didn't pass in connects. Yeah, so this actually needs um, connects as the first param. The screen went black for a second. There we go. So the migration completed. Uh, and if we refresh the database, uh, look at all the tables we've got. Um, and if we look at like item type, it just has a name. There's a unique constraint on the name column. It's looking good. We have our created at, updated at, deleted at columns. Yeah, this looks great. So now let's create the tables that require um, some foreign key references. Um, let's try to do things simply first. Yeah, so let's create the address table because uh, it has two foreign key references, um, but that's okay. We'll set that up. So we want the address table. Um, can I 
just like copy the text? <laughs> I don't know if I can. Um, so at this point, we need to wait for all of these tables to, to be created because we're about to create uh, tables that are um, dependent on those previous tables. So we have this promise.all, which we'll wait for these to create, and then we'll create um, our next tables. How can I just copy the text? I guess I can't. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, anyone can send images. Um, when calling the create name table function, aren't you? Yeah, I, yeah, I was. That's the error that we got. Thank you, uh, Persis. Um, thanks for the follow, Shines Love. Right click. Control click? I don't know. I think copying actually copies the image. It's okay. <laughs> oh, you know what? <laughs> Here's an idea. Um, one thing I didn't show last time is the uh, Lucid Chart has this export feature. And so if you click this, you actually get um, a, a SQL version of your tables. R right now, some of the types that I have are like totally wrong, but I can definitely copy and paste this and we'll use it as a reference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's our reference for the address table. So I'm going to say await connects.schema dot create table. Um, and we'll pass in the table name. So I want a table names dot address. I'll need to, to create that or define that. Get access to the table. Um, and then on table names, we will add uh, address like that. Um, and we can do our thing. So we'll say table dot increments. Uh, we'll say not nullable. So that gives us our ID column. That's great. Um, we'll need to add the street address. Um, is 255 characters good for a street address? I don't know, but the street address should be not nullable uh, because we at least require the first line of an address. Of an address. Um, but street address two can be null because you could have someone that doesn't have a second line to their address, at least with US-based address. And thanks for the follow floppy keyboard. Uh, the DB design tool is called Lucid Chart. There's actually a link to the chart uh, right below the live stream if you want to click it. Um, what's Happy Phone have to say? <laughs> I'm trying to embed audio. <laughs> um, that will not work. Um, okay. Yeah, any, any, any ideas? What is the maximum length of a street address? Two fifty five is probably a good limit. What's the character limit for USPS labels? <laughs> Uh, address line has a limit of 46 characters. Wow. Let's go with, we're going to go with 50 characters. Um, okay. So we have the addresses. Um, we have the city. That's the wrong thing. <laughs> so the column name is city. Uh, we'll have to figure out again, what's the maximum possible length of a city name um, when we'll make this not nullable because it must have a city. Um, though it looks like for USPS, um, the city maximum character count is 50. Yeah, longest street address in the US. 5 Waterfront Trail, Toronto, Ontario, M5J2H1, Canada. <laughs> and so the thing is, the address line 1 would just be um, 5 Waterfront Trail. <laughs> Longest town name in the world. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll default it to 50, uh, 50 characters. Uh, not nullable. Um, 
We then need to set up the state ID and the country ID. We'll do that in a second because that requires a foreign key reference and I'll show you how to set that up. Um, and then we need a zip code. And that's five characters, potentially with a dash followed by up to five more characters. Let's call it like a maximum of, let's just call it a maximum of 15 to be safe. Yeah, we're doing North America for sure. Uh, and thanks for the follow, Hermesh. <laughs> well, well the, oh, the longest street in the U.S. is in Canada. You're right. I, I was thinking like uh, North America. Maybe that's what they meant. Yeah, North America. <laughs> uh, all right, we have our zip code. Uh, did you did you find my IP address? Let's see what you got. Um, computer Hope? What are you talking about, Happy Phone? Calm down. I'm using a VPN. <laughs> and all of my overlays use image proxies. Um, okay, and then we need uh, latitude and longitude. Oops. Zip code, uh, latitude. Now, latitude... <laughs> um is probably going to be a float. I'll have to look at the connect docs to um, make sure that float exists, but I think that's what we want. Latitude, longitude. Uh, someone mentioned last time that certain databases actually have uh, like a point type built in, which can handle like an XY or a latitude longitude. Um, I'm okay with storing them separately though. Um, let's just look up in the connect stocks, um, float adds a float column with optional precision defaults to eight. That sounds good <laughs> for, for a latitude longitude up to eight decimal places. Okay. So this is our, sorry, this is our address table. Now we need to relate this to both the state table and the country table. So here's how we do that. We'll say uh, table dot references. Um, we'll put the um, we'll, we'll we'll first relate it to like state. Reference. I, I don't know. I have to look it up. Um, but you can spe you'll specify the table that we are referenced and relating to. Um, oh, I guess you can also do uh, table dot foreign. Let's look at that. And we want to do these other things as well. So I'm, I'm going to use their example that they have here. So for one thing, a, a, um, an integer ID in a SQL database is always a positive number, right? It's, you can never have a negative ID. So part of adding this foreign key reference is saying that uh, it is uh, unsigned. So I'll say um, table.integer state ID is an unsigned integer, meaning it can only be positive. Um, and then we'll say it references um, state.id. So I have a column, um, oh, sorry, I have a table called state and its ID column will be the foreign key reference for this state ID. Yeah. So table.integer unsigned references. Um, I think you can also do in table. Yeah. In table state like this. So you could, there are multiple ways of doing it. You can say uh, table that integer unsigned references ID in the table state. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Connects is a, definitely a, a backend framework um, for uh, <laughs> creating and communicating with SQL databases. Uh, but yeah, my, my IP address is absolutely um, localhost or 127.0.0.1. Okay. So that should set up the foreign key relationship to the other table. And if we look at our diagram, that is um, this line right here. So <laughs> we've just written the code that creates that connection from the address table to the state table. Um, and we want to do the exact same thing with the country ID. So uh, what I'm going to do is create another little helper function that creates this reference uh, reference column. Um, so we'll say references. We'll take in the table. What else are we going to need? We're going to take in the uh, column and then we'll take in the foreign 
table. And it will default to uh, ID in the other column. So we'll say um, table column foreign table. One thing we could do actually um, is automatically generate that foreign column, or sorry, the, the column name based on the table name. Um, So here we could say this is a string with table underscore ID. So it's always going to default to um, the table name ID. Why is this complaining? Argument name. Oh, this should be a table name. This should be foreign table name. Like that. Cool. So uh, <laughs> wait, there's. Oh, plug it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's 7%. Uh, okay, we're plugged in. I have to, I have to go pretty soon anyways. 9% <laughs> battery left. Oh, you silly people. Um, right now I'm choosing, choosing between two JavaScript frameworks, React and Vue. Uh, why choose, why not choose Vue? Don't choose Vue if React is more popular in terms of the job market in your area. Uh, don't choose Vue if you want to write a lot more code in React. Don't choose Vue if you want to have to know more about JavaScript and learn more about how JavaScript works, because that's what you're going to deal with in React. That's my reasons you shouldn't use Vue. Um, and thanks for the follow, Clunky. <laughs> yeah, the charger isn't in my inventory system yet. And I believe... Oh, no, it's just... Oh, no, it... Oh, no. Oh, no! Stop it! <laughs> Everything's gone horribly wrong. <laughs> oh, man. Come back. Come back, HDMI. Please. Let's try unplugging it and plugging it back in. There we go. Okay, I used duct tape to hold, to hold the charger in place. Um, we should be charging now. It's charging, it's lit up. <laughs> and thanks for the follow, uh, Junior Rogers. Thanks for the follow for Backbreaker. Um, do not, don't choose view if you don't want good code. <laughs> And thanks for the follow, Thomas Parsley. Why should I choose Vue? If you want less code, um, if you want, uh, if you don't want to have to deal with uh, immutable data, um, if you want uh, something that's potentially more consistent when you when you switch between Vue projects, yeah, yeah, we got a lot of followers this stream. Thanks, everyone. Much much appreciate appreciated. Uh, it's forbidden to multi-stream if you are an, a Twitch affiliate. I am not a Twitch affiliate, so I can do it. <laughs> okay, so we created this nice, useful, reusable function. And now I can say, uh, I can replace this and say uh, references. We'll pass in the table. We'll pass in um, state. Oh, that's all I need, actually. <laughs> Um, we're just going to put in the, the table name. Like that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to become a Twitch affiliate soon. So if you're watching on YouTube, you should probably go to Twitch instead and get, and get used to it. <laughs> uh, Twitch.tv slash Coding Garden. Uh, because pretty soon, I am not going to be streaming on YouTube. I'm still going to upload videos to YouTube, but um, I will not be streaming to YouTube. Uh, the theme is called Just Black. <laughs> um, I, I'm running low on time, uh, Barakat, so I can't really answer that question. But if you look at the beginning of the stream, there's a whole section where I talk about why you would use Connects versus something like SQLize. Um, okay, so now that we have that, we can say state and then also country. And so that should add a state ID and a country ID. Um... Yep, and we're gonna add our drop table here to table names.address. 
because we would want to drop that table before we drop the table that it references. <laughs> Join us on Twitch. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for the follow, Kaisis. Um, okay, here we go. Um, I kind of have to go, but I think I think we're at a point where we have written enough uh, helper functions that um, it'll be pretty easy to create these other tables, right? 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 <laughs> um, at this point, let's go ahead and create the manufacturer table because uh, it just depends on address. So we'll do that. Um, I'm going to copy this. I realize fun fun function is live as well, but you don't have to tell people because then they'll they'll leave my stream. Why would I want that to happen? <laughs> we'll, we'll probably just uh, go raid fun fun function after this, anyways. Depending on who's live, I don't know who's live. Um, table names dot manufacturer. Um, we'll add that here. Um, and. Get rid of all this stuff. And let's see what we got. Here it is. Cool. So we have our ID column, um, the manufacturer name. I'm not going to say that on this column, the manufacturer name is unique. Maybe you have two manufacturers with the same name, but I am going to make it not nullable because we will require a name. Um, logo URL is an actual, it's very similar to image URL. Um, I think I'm going to create another little helper that creates um, an image column. Uh, column name. So you do something like this, and then we can reuse this. And all of our all of our URLs that we're storing in our system will always be a maximum length of 2,000. So now I can use this image function. Just say image with table and image URL. Like that. And then similarly, uh, I can add the logo URL right here. Um, we also want description. We're going to default, we're going to give it a maximum length of a thousand. And, um, this can be null because you could have the description as blank. <laughs> uh, how do references work? So the references are creating... Um, a foreign key relationship to another table. So basically it's just the SQL code that adds a foreign key constraint to the given table. Um, so when I say references state, this is actually saying uh, references uh, table uh, state ID, references table state for, for the column ID. Um, and references is just a helper function I created that actually does the connects code to create that column. So there's that. Um, we actually have the manufacturer type as text. I think I would want that to actually be a, be a foreign table with like a lookup of the different types. Cause you could have like a food manufacturer or an electronics manufacturer. Um, I'm just going to make this red for now. <laughs> we'll come back to it and fix that. Uh, we also want a uh, website URL. And so actually, I, should, I think I should rename this function to be uh, URL because it applies to image URLs and website URLs. Yeah. So website URL. Ugh. <laughs> Uh, is there any specific reason why I would use table names .manufacture instead of declaring just the name of the table as manufacturer? Uh, I talked about this earlier, but the main reason is to prevent typos. Um, so technically, and um, I mean, if you look at the connect documentation, you literally can just pass in a string right here, right? I can actually just say, um, 
like that manufacture that would work just fine but i'm i'm referencing that table name in multiple places for one i reference that table name whenever i create the table um, i reference that table name whenever i'm dropping tables i later on will reference that name whenever i'm selecting data from the table using connects um, and the other cool thing is by putting it in that object, I get autocomplete. So I can just say table names dot manufacturer, and then I don't have to think about the spelling or potentially have a typo in the table name or anything like that. That's that's the main reason. Um, all right, we have website URL. Uh, what's the maximum possible length of an email? Um, Yeah, very similar to types in Redux. You technically could have all cap strings all over the place, but you create them as um, reusable like cons, so that way you don't have to retype them everywhere in your code. S same reason. 254? An email address must not exceed 254 characters. Well, that's good to know. I should probably set that up on my user table as well. Oh yeah, we did that earlier, didn't we? Let's create another helper function. <laughs> Let's call it email. Um, column name, 254, not nullable and unique. No, I, I think the not nullable and unique um, is dependent on where that email is. Let's do this. So now I can say uh, email, the column is email, um, not nullable and unique. Um, but then down here, I can just say email. Oh, I need to pass in the table. So I forgot that. Oh, buddy. Table. Email. Cool. And one of the things I just did there is this this function actually returns that, so that way I can chain it. So I can say email dot not nullable and dot not unique, or in dot unique. Whereas down here, this is the email for a manufacturer. So potentially two different manufacturers have the same email, or maybe the email is missing. So that's why I'll allow it to be nullable. Yeah, cool. Um, and then we need uh, to reference the address table. So I'll say references uh, table and uh, reference address. So that's good. Um, I think that's it. So that's it for the manufacturer table. Um, I do have to go though. So I think I'm going to stop there. <laughs> um, but you can see where this is going at, at the end of the day. Um, I'll just have to implement these other tables. I'll have to add the foreign key constraints. Um, and after that, our, our tables will be ready to go and we can start potentially inserting in sample data and then eventually create a, uh, an API on top of it. But let's just do this real quick. Let's, let's run the code. Um, I'm going to do a connects rollback real quick just to make sure that this actually runs. Yes, I need to get rid of that. Cool. Um, so it rolled back, and now we're going to do a migrate uh, latest. Cool. And if we look at our database structure, uh, where's where's that that tool thingy? Where did it go? It's that localhost uh, eighty ninety, isn't it? This. Oh, it's not MySQL, it's uh, uh, Postgres. Let's go. Okay, cool. So uh, now you can see we have uh, all 10 tables. Um, and let's look at one of the tables that has foreign key references. So if we look at the address table, we can see these foreign key constraints that got created. So there's state ID, which targets the ID column on the state. Oh, one thing I totally forgot is um, we're actually gonna add on delete cascade. So you can see right here on delete, no action. Um, but what I want is, if I were to delete something in the foreign table, I want all of its references to be deleted as well, because then technically it's stale data. Uh, we have 10 tables, yes. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll, I'll push to GitHub for sure. Um, so because I have this handy references function, I can update them all in one go. And I'll just say um, on delete cascade. 
And that will say, if I delete something in a foreign column, if it has any references to other columns, those should be deleted as well. Now, we talked about earlier that we're doing soft deletes. So technically, this shouldn't really ever happen. But if it does, I want to make sure that the, um, the constraints are still in place and we don't have any stale data. So now that I added that, let's roll back. And then we'll migrate again. And now if we look at this table, we see that when I delete a state, any addresses that were referencing that state will technically be deleted because I have on delete cascade. So that's good to go. Um, all right, yeah, let's push this up to GitHub. Um, let's see, create a new repo. Inventory app. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, I need to make sure I have a git ignore file. So I want to ignore my node modules. I want to ignore this Docker data. So I would never push up this DB data because this contains all of the, um, the, um, what do you call it? The data for the database in the Docker container. And I don't want that on, uh, on GitHub. So, uh, let's add a git ignore. Uh, this little tool generates that by default, it's going to ignore like my node modules, but I'm going to have it ignore the, um, Docker data folder. Is there anything else? Oh yeah. I mean, I think by default we are ignoring, um, .env. So that's good. Uh, I am going to create a sample .env. And let's create a readme. <laughs> An app to keep track of your inventory of items. Um, setup, we'll say uh, backend setup. Docker compose up. I'll say um, create a dot env with your values. <laughs> Run docker compose up. Uh, migrate the database. npm run migrate. Install dependencies. Does the order really matter? Not so much. <laughs> um, database, database. Thank you. Thank you, coding pasta. <laughs> um, Uh, thanks for the follow, Sid. Thanks for the follow, Pants for Birds. Um, tomorrow is DJ's birthday, so happy birthday, DJ. <laughs> uh, the point of the env.sample is um, I'm th this file I'm going to push up to GitHub, and that way when someone pulls down the repo, they know what variables will need to exist uh, in the .env file. So technically, um, well, not technically, I am not going to push this .env file to GitHub because there could be some very secret values in here because it's information for connecting to the database. Um, so that won't go to GitHub, but this will go to GitHub. Um, and in this scenario, both my sample and my .env, they're not special in any way, but eventually I might actually put uh, some like production information in here and I would never want to push that to GitHub, which is why I have the, the sample file. What did I call it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I t I, we designed the database last time and that's when we mainly normalize things. There's still some things that need to be fixed, but 
we have the, the basics of creating the tables. There's still more tables we need to create. We'll do that next time. Um, and then we can start to create some basic API. Imp well, no, before that, we'll seed the database. So like, we'll seed the database with states and counties, uh, sorry, countries. Uh, we'll seed the database with locations in my house, um, item types, different things that are gonna be fairly the same after we actually build the application, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see the database. So we'll do that next time. I don't know when that will be. I most likely will be streaming again tonight um, for Code Cut Us. So tune in for that. Um, let's see. Package, package, that looks good to me. Um, <laughs> trying too hard to recall. <laughs> um, a data warehouse database? What do you mean by that? I'm not familiar with that term. What am I doing? Okay, GitHub, GitHub. We could we could raid fun fun function. Um, we we've raided him in the past though, and he doesn't really seem to pay attention to raids that happen. So I don't know if we'll do that. Um, we'll see who else is live. Um, is InstaFluff live? Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll raid InstaFluff. Cool. Okay, the code's on GitHub. <laughs> Check it out here. Uh, and if you are watching on YouTube, you should absolutely head over to uh, twitch.tv slash coding garden. Um... There it is. Head over there. We're going to do a good old fashioned raid, um, which is where we take all the viewers of one stream and put them into another stream. Um, oh, yeah, Mastermind is live. That might be good to raid. Let's see who's live. And uh, there you go. Andrew has sent the raid message. Go ahead and copy and paste that message. Um, that's the message we're going to send whenever we go into that other channel. Um, oh, that's wrong. The only thing about Mastermind is I believe he has followers only chat on. So that's a little tricky for a raid. Let's see. Is it followers only? I don't know. Let's see what, what is InstaFluff working on? Stardew mod. That sounds fun. And what is fun, fun, function working on? Um, he has this really cool check-in app. I, I was, I was watching his stream yesterday. Let's see. Oh, he's adding colors. This will be fun. We're going to raid fun, fun function. Um, just because, <laughs> uh, yeah. And so copy and paste that raid message. Get ready. Get ready. Um, <laughs> raid me. Cool. copy and paste the raid message. Uh, be nice. Ask good questions, be friendly when we go over there. Um, and like I mentioned, I will be streaming, look at all the drops. <laughs> I, I will be streaming again uh, tonight around um, six or 7 p.m. Mountain Time, which is five or six p.m. Pacific Time. But just tune, uh, just look at the channel for notifications of when I go live and things like that. We'll be doing code katas. Thanks everyone for hanging out. Thanks for all the the questions and the chats and uh, just 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 in general. Thanks for being here. This was fun. <laughs> so uh, wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night. And until next time, here's this. Mm -hmm.